again to uh, the Institute for Contemporary Affairs and the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. I mean, we figured when we uh, asked Dr. Gedar to join us, we figured we'd choose a date where we figured there wouldn't be that much else going on in the world. <laughs> so, and I thought, and I'm sure we were proven uh, uh, incorrect. It truly uh, is an historical moment in American history, and I say as an American, an Israeli of American descent, uh, an extraordinary moment in American history. And, uh, and clearly, um, no less a dramatic moment in the history of the of the free world and the international community at large. Uh, clearly, the profound effect of Senator Obama's now President-elect Obama's victory will have ripple effects um, in democracies throughout the world, and clearly Israel. Uh, has been, as you may have heard on the radio this morning or uh, read about in uh, uh, perhaps on some of the internet updates, um, people are already talking in Israel about how this may help us think about our vibrant democracy in ways that we hadn't thought about it before or uh, to expand the way we think about living in a multicultural uh, democracy, no less than the United States does, but clearly with differences in history and culture and religion in this country even more pronounced um, than the United States. Um, within that context, I'm going to introduce our speaker, who's clearly in, in the context of a multicultural society in which we have uh, a very uh, a, a vibrant uh, Arab minority in this country. Uh, we decided that we would bring really one of the great authorities in the Middle East, in the state of Israel, on the <coughs> issue of Arab society, Arab culture, uh, that is Dr. Mordechai Kedar to my right. Dr. Kedar was a, a high-ranking officer in Israeli military intelligence for 25 years. Um, is uh, extraordinarily fluent in Arab-Israeli political discourse, and also is a has, speaks a beautiful Arabic and teaches Arabic uh, as a scholar at Bar Ilan University. And I think that um, we're really in for somewhat of a treat to be able to to learn from Dr. Kedar some of the intricacies of the way uh, Arab uh, culture thinks about, uh, thinks about things, especially in this country, in, the re in terms of the recent difficulties in the ACO riots, and perhaps one of the major challenge challenges in that context of a democratic society as that the state of Israel is, is the role of radical Islamic groups as one of the um, external uh, challenges that uh, this society has to uh, has to deal with in as far as it affects Arab-Israeli relations. I'm going to ask Dr. Kedar uh, to speak, but to open, perhaps you'll comment just for a couple minutes, uh, uh, Motsi, about the reaction, as he's already spoken in some of the Arabic uh, uh, BBC and some of the other major press outlets about the election. How is it going to impact the Arab world and, and uh, the world of Islam? Dr. Kedar. Thank you very much, Dan. I hope to meet the description of the sky. Um, I think that the, what we hear today in the our media about what happened in the United States, United States is not yet crystallized. Uh, you hear all kinds of uh, expressions, like uh, people, some are very satisfied, because, uh, first of all, because uh, George W. Bush is going to step out. This, I think, there are no dispute in the Arab world that this already come the time. They, many of them in the Arab world, felt deep humiliation from George W. before everything else. Humiliation. And this, uh, you cannot ignore the way of the Islamic view to what happens here. As you might know, uh, Islam in its own view came to the world to replace Judaism and Christianity, not to live side by side with it. And here all of a sudden comes a religious um, president and uh, some occupies Iraq, which is the beating heart of the Arab history, the capital of the Abbasid Empire, Abbasid Dynasty, which for 500 years ruled the Islamic Empire. The biggest achievements on the ground of the Islamic Empire 
were from Baghdad. And now, uh, within what, four days, five days of fighting on Baghdad, and, and this city becomes another American infidel. Uh, oh, this is humiliation before it's everything else. So, and, and this is connected to the personality of Bush, who went to a crusade by his own words. And crusade, of, of course, takes us back 800 years ago to the, exactly to this place, to the crusade kingdom, which was here, and Islam, by the uh, hero Sal Saladin, succeeded to wipe them out from this place. And all of a sudden they come again by, by, the, by the Americans under the slogan of Kusei. He said it once. Or, uh, immediately, his advisors told him not to use this word. I would say use it once too many. But, and they recorded it, and Al Jazeera, for example, keeps bringing this. We are on the Kusei now. When he was told that this is Bilan, he didn't mean Kusei. I mean, Kusei, you know what Kusei is. What, what broad uh, 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 meaning of this word. But they caught it, and they keep saying, we are under an American Christian crusade. It means looking at this from a religious point of view. And this is, and no doubt, they see it as some kind, at least many of them, uh, look at this as some kind of, who, which, who, whose God is more powerful, our Allah or their God. And this is how too many people in the Middle East are viewing this. When this man steps out. All of a sudden, it is retrospectively some kind of victory of Allah on God. So this is behind the um, <coughs> this is what is in the basis of the happiness which many people are, are not even bashful, uh, not even embarrassed to express these days in the or these hours actually in the Arab world and the Arab media. After all, uh, one of the major differences between the Middle East and Western societies, which we all know, is the role of religion. We were brought up on the notion of the division between state and church. That the state is for everybody and religion is within your heart. This is correct in the West. It is not correct here in this area. Religion oversets everything. Religion is everything in society, in politics, in economics. Everything is somehow connected to religion. You cannot divide religion from anything in this Middle East. And this, I think, actually brings us to uh, the main subject which I wanted to talk about, which is the relations here inside Israel between the Jews and the Arab minorities. And I emphasize the plural because we have Muslims, we have Jews, we have Christians. This is from the religious point of view. We have Bedouins, those who live in the desert, which is one culture. We have Falahim, and the peasants, which is another culture. We have those who dwell in cities, whether in uh, Arab cities or mixed cities, which is another uh, kind of uh, culture. So, in, in, in everything which you, in every way you look at the Arab minorities in Israel, you find out that it is, you cannot uh, look at them as one package of uh, people. This is you have to relate to them in different ways because they are different and they don't even uh, uh, consider themselves as one group of uh, people maybe, maybe a small group of intellectuals who are more, let's say, left behind the traditional loyalties to the tribe, to the clan, to the family to the religion, to other traditional uh, frameworks they can come out and forge some kind of modern uh, frameworks like political parties, uh, for example, uh, Khadash or Balad, which contain people uh, from different backgrounds. 
But this is very modern thing, and uh, I'm not so sure that they have deep roots in the uh, population. You can see it very easily by the uh, percentage of how, how many people are voting. Uh, unfortunately, some would say, a number of Arabs who are voting for the Knesset, for their own parties, not Jewish parties, for their own parties, is something like 50%. Only 50%. Means, if the Arab sector in Israel altogether is like uh, 20%, they could have a party of 24 uh, <coughs> members in the Knesset, which is a fifth of the 120. 24, right? However, when you count the Arab Knesset members who are representing Arab uh, parties, you see 8, 9, 10. These are the numbers for the last, uh, let's say, 10 or 12 years. So, uh, evidently, they have in the Knesset representation of F of their power in society. And this, this has uh, uh, many reasons. But uh, you cannot deny the fact that many of them <coughs> uh, do not even have any... Uh, they don't see the voting to the Knesset as something which can be presented. This is why uh, some of them do not. Others, and this is also a, a very important, the Islamic movement, at least one part of the Islamic movement, the more radical one, is constantly calling their people not to go to the Knesset, not to go, not to, go to vote for the Knesset, because the mere voting in the Knesset is some kind of seal of approval which is being given to the state which has no legitimacy to exist in their own eyes. So how can you vote to a state where you don't believe it should exist? So this is the message and this is the real problem because this of course leads us to what happened in Mexico, in, in Akko, uh, which is uh, I, I would like to, to get to this from another another angle. What happened, everybody knows, a car went into a Jewish neighborhood in Akko on the night of uh, Yom Kippur. Yes radio, no radio, yes drove uh, uh, with, uh, not carefully. I, I don't want to get into the details because the, the details are not that important. The, the important point is, or I would say there are some important points about what happened in, in, uh, in, in Akko, which I would say lasted for, four, for five days. Five half days of riots, of uh, demonstrations, breaking uh, 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 shoes <coughs> of, uh, of um, shops, burning uh, apartments, burning houses. Like five days, those uh, uh, riots were. But... The most important point, which was, which should have been pointed out already those days, is what happened in Akko did not spread to other mixed cities. There was something small in Yafo, something very small in Yafo, and nothing we heard in Ramle, Lod, Nazareth elite, up in Nazareth which is also today a mixed um, city. Carmiel, <coughs> which also has a significant uh, Arab population. We didn't hear about anything in those days. And everybody knew about this. Because everybody was watching TV, everybody was listening to the radio, everybody was reading newspapers, and everybody knew that there are problems in, in Akko. Okay, there were people who went to Akko to help both sides, to support both sides, but yet these uh, these events did not spread to other cities. And this is a, ver a very important point to point out. Yes, what happened in Akko happened. Nobody can deny it. But it did not spread to other places which contain the same, or which have the same problems which Akko suffers from. Which is friction between populations which do not like each other. Um, neighborhoods are being popular, uh, which were historically, or not, uh, until recently, populated by one side, are taken by the other side, by what? Apartment by apartment. Okay? Uh, like Shkunat Wolfson, the Wolfson neighborhood in, in, in Akko, which was built by 
a Jewish donor, uh, Mr. Wolfson, and four Jews. And in the process of some years, most of the apartments were sold to our, to our people. People had their apartments, they could do whatever they liked. But when one apartment is being sold to uh, an Arab, other neighbors of the Jewish neighborhood uh, somehow find or want to find a way out if they can sell the apartment. And uh, well, I cannot deny the, the fact that there is not much love and hugs and kisses between, maybe on the personal, personal basis, but on the communal basis, there are problems. And uh, Shonat Wolfson uh, became an Arab uh, neighborhood in Akko. Most of it except for the synagogue. The synagogue, a group of uh, Jewish students, came and made a yeshiva there, and some kind of Jewish institution there, and they stick to the synagogue in order to prevent the turning of this synagogue into a mosque. Footnote, what we witness in places like France, uh, especially when uh, uh, churches in villages and neighborhoods turn into mosques. And everybody knows about what goes on in France, knows exactly what I'm talking about. So, of course, the mere fact that they are there in uh, in Wolfson neighborhood is some kind of a, a nail or what is it called? a fingernail in the eyes of the Arabs. They don't like it because they see them and they are, look too Zionist and the Arabs don't like it and okay. This is a one place of friction. However, whatever what happened in, 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 in Akko did not spread it. This is very important. Secondly, why didn't, that didn't it spread to other cities? I think that in the end of the day, both sides, Jews and Arabs, know that the price of rights in other places will be much more than what every side would like to pay. Means, okay, we can burn them, we can, they can burn us, there will, but there will be problems, but the, the damages which will be to both sides are much bigger than what both sides can gain from this side, from this, uh, you know, from the rights. Means coexistence, in spite of the fact that neither of the sides like it, is still better than uh, co-fighting. And both sides know it. In many other places, tension there is. Yet we do not no we do nothing because we will ha we'll pay a very, very high price. So in Yafo, and look, in Yafo is the easiest thing because Tel Aviv is right uh, across the spring, and in Yafo also there, there are processes which Arabs don't like what happened in their cities, in Akko, in Yafo, in in other places as well. Um, uh, property is being taken by the state whether it was belonging to Arabs or not, it's a question. And it's given, it is given to all kinds of contractors and they build new houses, especially in Yafo, near the sea. And those apartments which are being built are being sold for who knows how much for people who can afford a nice living in new neighborhoods in, in, in Yafo, especially. And it creates much of resentment in Yafo because these buildings are built on places where Arabs were living through history. Now the state, since uh, they were populated by, by they, they belong to the state because people uh, ran away in 1948 and uh, the state confiscated those properties. Now the state is selling it to all kinds of companies which uh, uh, built on those, on these uh, properties, uh, uh, nice housing, uh, mainly for Jews. So, there is reason for this resentment. However, it's uh, according to the law. Whether this law is, uh, is uh, correct or not, there is a question. Uh, depends whom you ask. The problem, the deep problem, is not what we do to property or things like this. The, que the question is, at the bottom, the bottom line of the question is, to whom 
this country belongs. And this is the basic question which every other question is driven for this. According to the Arab narrative, this is an Arab Islamic state. Waqf means a um, whole endowment since the days of Omar al Khattab, the caliph who conquered this country in, in the second uh, quarter of the 7th century. Then he declared, according to the Islamic hadith, to the oral tradition, he declared that this country between the sea and the Jordan River is a land of waqf, means belongs to the Muslims all over the world and nobody can take it anymore forever. So, how could Jews come in the 19th or 20th century and uh, buy land it belongs to Muslims, to the Islamic Ummah? according to the story, and more uh, establish a state, an uh, independent state, Jewish state. Jews can live under the ages of Islam, as al as uh, uh, people who can live under the whole of Islam. How come this, this state is a deed of a Satan? It has no legitimate legitimacy to exist on uh, 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 Islamic soil. Footnote, just like Spain, Sicily, parts of the Balkan, which were in different parts <laughs> of the Greek lands of Islam. So how could the Spaniards, Christians, can uh, build their, their state? This should. A land, according to Islam, has only one way ticket to become Islam, not outside. So according to it, to the you Islam, the state of Israel, or what, especially what the Muslim Brotherhood, the wings of uh, Muslim Brotherhood, also in this country, believe that this country, this state, the, the Israeli state, the Jewish state, has no right to exist to begin with. So, since when Jews have the right to dwell in Akko or in other places as owners or as sovereign uh, state? So to begin with, the Islamic approach to the state of Israel is rather negative. This is why organizations like Hamas, the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, and other wings like Narda of uh, Tun Tun Tunisia cannot even consider recognizing the right of Israel to exist. Maybe it come to terms for, for a period, for uh, 10 years, 20 years, temporal peace. This is okay, like uh, Prophet Muhammad came to terms with the infidels of Mecca in, in Hudaybiyah in the 628 and he gave them peace, temporal peace later he violated it but uh, temporal peace can be given to infidels when well, Muslims cannot uh, uh, conquer the, the lands when he's not powerful enough but uh, when Allah uh, uh, gives the Muslims the possibility there is a dispute whether they can violate the peace, or they should violate the temple of peace. Okay, between can and should, Israel has no right to exist forever. Maybe for an uh, interim uh, uh, period, until Muslims can deal with this in the proper way. So, uh, this is, to begin with, Israel as a state has no right to exist, according to the Islamic uh, narrative. This is, by the way, why the uh, head of the uh, Islamic movement, Sheikh Ibrahim Abdullah Sosu, who is a Knesset member in the Israeli Knesset, writes in a communique which he issued after the uh, riots in Akko. He says like this, Akko was and will ever be an Arab city in its history, in its sea, S-E-A, in its uh, air, and in its soil. Before and after, and, and before and after everything, in its man. The human being of Akko is Arab, who proved through generations that he is more powerful than all the massacres and the aggression, and on his rock all the conspiracies will be slaughtered. 
Quote, end quote. This is what Ibrahim Abdallah Sassou, Knesset member, is writing in the aftermath of this, of what happened in Akko. The most important word in this uh, little quotation is, all the conspiracies will be slaughtered. Why? Conspiracy, Mu'amara, is a, a word or a, a term which they use inter alia to the crusade campaign uh, during uh, the, the centuries since the 10th to the 12th century. And Acre, as you might know, was a very well known battlefield of the crusades between Saladin and Baibars and others. And when he says that on the rock of Acre all the conspiracies will be, slu will be slaughtered, he reminds us of the conspiracy of the West. When the, when the West implanted the, uh, the crusade state here in Israel, in Jerusalem, and in Acre especially, and the Muslims succeeded to slaughter this conspiracy, that conspiracy. Now, by saying this, in the context of Acre, he means the Zionist conspiracy. He doesn't, read it, he doesn't uh, write it in a clear way. He conceals this message, because if he writes it, he will be, I don't know what, too many people will not like it, especially those who understand it. But when he writes it in such a hidden way, it needs a commentary in order to open this uh, nut, in order to, uh, to understand what really he means. But this is the rhetoric, this, these are the terms, and this is, this is the real meaning of what he uh, says. means that he, although he sits in the Knesset, Meanwhile, after all, it's a interim peace with the state. After all, this is what we have. We cannot uh, uh, do anything about this. So, if you cannot beat them, join them. Meanwhile, and uh, tries to make the best out of all the situations. And sit in the Knesset, lives on, on pension from the state later, but still uh, uh, relates to the state as a conspiracy, or Western conspiracy, just like the uh, uh, Crusade uh, campaign. This is the way <coughs> how uh, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood at large is looking at the state and the Jewish state here in Israel and the fact that uh, the Jews uh, occupied this country from and took it out from the Islamic bosom uh, in which it was until 1940. And when you come to the question to whom this uh, country belongs. This is the basis of the Islamic way how to look at this question and of course the answer is more than clear. On the contrary, Jews feel that this country belongs to them. After all, this country was populated by Jews and uh, uh, two kingdoms were here uh, until 1900 years ago. We Jews were expelled with no justification, 19, more than 1900 years ago. And we came back to our country. This is how the Jews are looking at this place. This is what gives us the justification to have our state here, and not in Uganda, and not in Argentina, and not in Birobijan, and in, in, all, in every place which the world tried to solve the Jewish process. The country is Islamic, and the Jewish narrative, which, is, which states that this a country in its attorney, uh, uh, entirely uh, 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 belongs to Jews. However, okay, we still we want to keep the Jewish nature of our uh, state, and we are not willing to kick uh, uh, those Arabs uh, outside, at least uh, most of us. I'm not talking about uh, this uh, part or other. I'm talking about the mainstream of the Jewish population. And we know that somehow we want to keep our state with a major Jewish majority. And we, many of us are talking about the state solution, other solutions. Somehow, we do not dream to have the Kasbah of Shechem 
a uh, part of the state of Israel. Uh, okay, so we have the 20% of Arabs uh, in the Galilee, in the, in the Negev, in the Tigan, in, in the center. Okay, it doesn't mean that we have to keep Gaza and to keep Hebron, to keep Shechem, and to keep other places as well. Okay, but this is a, 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 a dispute. How and where should be uh, uh, the borders between Israel and the Palestinian state or states? So far we have only two states. Uh, Palestinian states, one in Gaza, one in somewhere in the West Bank, maybe it would be. Uh, I think that uh, we, have, we should have eight Palestinian states, or I would say Palestinian Emirates, uh, according to the tribal division of the uh, Palestinian people, if there isn't such a people at all, which nobody can uh, surely say, depends how you check it. Um, Maybe some think that if we leave religion aside from both sides and we try to find solution, a uh, political solution, not a religious solution, since religion, religion makes problems here, because every, every religion looks at the whole country as a whole country as belongs either to the Jews or to the Muslims. Maybe let's circumvent the religions and try to find a political solution, which will be a modern solution, <laughs> and uh, many would uh, uh, support this, this approach, and uh, because this is maybe the only way how to come to any kind of solution uh, between uh, the Jews and Arabs, whether, whether inside Israel or between us and Palestinians. Means, let's go to intellectuals, modern intellectuals on in both sides, and see how they deal with the Jewish uh, question of how to manage life in this country. And uh, from the beginning, uh, somebody would say, since there are intellectuals, and intellectuals are more realistic, are more, let's say, looking for solutions, not for problems, then we can find good solutions for hard problems. However, when we come to what, ha what happens inside Israel, we find that uh, this assumption that modern intellectuals might be more flexible and might bend some givens or some axioms in order to find solutions, we find that this assumption uh, is not necessarily uh, valid. Why? Uh, during 2006, a, a group of uh, modern, very modern, Arab intellectuals, politicians, um, lecturers in universities, a group of like uh, 40 people, significant, uh, uh, I would say, the intellectual leadership of the Arab sector in Israel, came out with a very interesting document, uh, which they published in both, in Hebrew and in Arabic. Arabic for themselves, and in Hebrew for <coughs> Jews, so nobody can be mistaken while they translate it to Hebrew. The, it, the Hebrew is theirs, means read our lips, in Hebrew. Uh, this, this document, uh, which was uh, agreed upon by the most significant uh, organ of the Arabs in Israel, uh, the unification of all the Arab uh, um, organizations, um, published this document. And this uh, document, the uh, future vision, this is the, the name, the future vision of the uh, Palestinian Arabs in Israel and their relations with the state. This is the uh, 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 title of the, uh, of the uh, document. The document says, and I translate it to English, Israel is the outcome of a colonialistic action which was initiated by the Jewish Zionist elites in Europe and in the West was established with the help of colonialistic states Britain and France and was strengthened by the influx of Jews into Palestine especially in the aftermath of the a Second World War and the Holocaust. And I must say, I salute to them that they at least recognize the fact that there was a Holocaust. 
many Arab sectors, they, they deny them. Is, I repeat, Israel is an outcome of a colonialistic action. Colonialistic action. Like France in Algeria, Britain in India, uh, Holland in South Africa, uh, Belgium in Congo, and Britain in Palestine. This is Israel. Now, this code, colonialistic, colonialistic action, is meant to one thing, to undermine the legitimacy of the existence of the state as the state of the Jewish people, who uh, were and maybe still are the owners or were the owners of this of this country 19, until 1900 years ago means a total denial of the Jewish history which is surprisingly an echo of Islamic approach to the Jewish history because according to Islam since the Hijra or since Islam came to the world in the year of 622 the Hijra of Muhammad from Mecca to Medina, all the history which was until that time lost its meaning, lost its, lost its significance. Even the prophets, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Solomon, Jesus, uh, Johannes, all of them became Muslims according to this uh, discourse of Islam. All of them, if you don't know, were Muslims. Okay? So, since Islam denies the, what happened before, what was before Islam, and even if it happened, it does not mean anymore, since Islam came to the world, now they can say that Israel is an outcome of colonialistic action, because the fact that Jews were here 19 years ago before Islam does not mean anything anymore since Islam came to the world. So although this document was formulated by intellectuals, modern intellectuals, some of them by the way are Christians, it echoes with the echo which comes from this uh, uh, document and analyzing the formulation of this document leads us back to the way Islam as a religion looks at the state of Israel and its existence on this waqf land. And this uh, 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 document is replete with uh, all kinds of expressions which again lead to this kind of uh, vision how Israel is an illegitimate entity and we the Arabs are the natives the Jews are immigrants, they came to our country and we considered ourselves the owners as the natives and they should consider us as the real owners of the country. Although we are minority, they, according to this document, should take our opinion in every crucial uh, 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 decision in this country. Whether it is acceptable or not, I leave it for another discussion, but this is the way they approach, the way, the way they look at the state where they live. Uh, many have very simple question. What state can allow such a thing? That a significant minority is challenging the legitimacy of the state. Even the Look, I, I don't know about any other uh, situation in the world where Arabs or Muslims are challenging the legitimacy. What? Arabs and Muslims in, in, in Britain or in, in, in France are challenging the legitimacy of... Maybe it will come in some point in the future when there will be majority. And they are marching to this point. But so far we haven't seen such... such. Of course, they are natives here, so they allow themselves to do this. But when, when they said that they are natives, again, there are some questions. Look, many Palestinians, even, even in Israel, bear names like Al-Masri, Al-Iraqi, 
Al Tarabulsi. Tarabulsi means they came from Tripoli, from Tripoli, in North Lebanon. Sidawi, Dibini, Sorani, villages of places in Lebanon. Al Khorani, the minister of refugees in the Palestinian uh, government of Abu Ala. Was na his name was Abdallah al Khorani. Al Khorani means that he, either he or his parents <coughs> came from Al Khoran, from Syria, today is southern Syria. Az Zarqawi, and many other names which testify until this very day that they, they are not originally from this place. They emigrated to here and were marked by naming them in the name of the place which they come, came from. Pinsker, okay? Uh, like, okay. Uh, since when they are Palestinians? And those who are Palestinian refugees, who are today, like in Lebanon, uh, mm -hmm. and the West Bank, and refugee camps, with the question, how come 60 years after 1948, 60 years, they are still in refugee camps? Whereas in the world you see refugee camps of 60 years. Okay? Another uh, cultural problem which uh, uh, relates only to the Middle East. But, uh, uh, where do they have the right to return to? Those Iraqi and Muslim and Tarabulsi and Zarqawi and uh, Sorani and Khorani to Haifa where they worked for a few, day, for few years for the British who brought them from the Khoran to work in the harbor of Haifa or maybe to Syria, to the Khoran where they originally came from. Okay? So the, the world bought this slogan of Palestinian refugees without checking where they, where they came from originally. So when they come today and say that they are the natives of this country, who goes to their names to check whether they are really originally from this country? Okay? So the slogan that they are the natives of this country is at least for part of them in question. Secondly, there is another thing which everybody should bear in mind. I'm sorry to say that 300 million Arabs in the world today live in one of two situations. Either on the forefathers land in dictatorships, in states like Syria, Algeria, Jordan to an extent, Iraq until uh, 2003, dictatorships. In no state you can easily change the president, free elections, democracy, we are not. So either they live on their forefathers' lands in dictatorships, or in democracies, but in exile. France, Britain, Belgium, Holland, okay, in exile, in democracies. Okay? No Arab state is a real democracy, not even Lebanon. Not, even, not real democracy. Especially in future Lebanon, which will be a Shiite state. The only group, significant group, of Arabs who live in democracy, yet on their, allegedly, their forefathers' land is the Arabs in Israel. The only group of Arabs in the world who combine the two things democracy and on their own land. Only here. People tend to forget it. They do not. Because they do not want to shake the boat too much. Because, in spite of the opinions, <laughs> in spite of the resentment, but of, you know what? Discrimination. Yes. There is discrimination against Arab, Arabs in this country. I don't deny it. In almost every field. Education, infrastructure, and investments. What the, you, you name it. Right. I'm not trying to, to cover the situation in the Arab sector, which is f because of various reasons. Whether external means the state or internal reasons as well. There are domestic reasons almost everywhere for the neglect, for many problems which they suffer from uh, in, in their villages, cities, 
on the humans. Yes, there is discrimination. Yet, most of them, I would say the vast majority, do not want to turn this state into an Arab state by undermining totally the Jewishness of this, or the Israelity of this uh, state. They know the alternative. Because the alternative is the, I would say, the, the Arab state, the regular Arab state. No one of them wants to live in an Arab state. How do we know? They stay here, usually. They don't use the Israeli uh, 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 passport to emigrate. Well, there is immigration, like everywhere. But there is no lines of Arabs who are uh, lining to, uh, uh, to emigrate to other places. In spite of the fact that the Israeli, that the Israeli uh, uh, passport opens every gate in Europe and in many other states as well. Unlike the Arab passports, which opens nothing in the world today. Still, they appreciate the fact that they live in Israel, in the Israeli democracy, protected by the Supreme Court, which is the biggest uh, uh, um, watchdog, watchdog on their rights, and they know exactly the situation because they compare it, because they see the, the situation of Al Jazeera day and night. What goes on in Iraq, what goes on in Darfur, what goes on in Syria, what goes on in Egypt, what goes on everywhere. Look, in Egypt, 49, 50 maybe, percent of the population lives in Ashwaiyat, in unplanned neighborhoods, with no running water, electricity, sewage, infrastructure, paved roads, healthcare, nothing. Nobody here in Israel, in the Arab sector, lives in such situation. Maybe there are some Bedouins in the Negev who willingly are not entering the cities which were uh, bought and which were built for them. They choose, because they are Bedouins, culture of the, of the desert, they choose to live everyone with 500 dunam, with a hill of 500 dunam, instead of uh, one and a half or one dunam in, in one of the cities. Okay, Bedouins, I cannot uh, do anything about this. They live, and the state also gave up on them with the polygamy and everything which they have. The state just uh, doesn't know what to do with them. <laughs> 70,000 of them are living in such situation. They are living in unplanned neighborhoods. But yet, rocks are not falling on them like what happened in Egypt uh, uh, two months ago. Okay, so uh, what I'm saying is that the Arab sector in Israel the Arab sector, sectors still want to keep this country or this state maybe, maybe make it better for them but they do not want to change it into and most of them do not want to change it into an Arab state maybe the margins of the Islamic movement would like to have an Islamic state here just like they want to have an Islamic state everywhere, in Egypt, in Jordan, and to kick out the Arab regimes and to put the Khilafah, the Caliphate, instead, especially Hizb al Tahrir, on those who uh, walk on their paths. But uh, 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 I, I would say the mainstream and the majority of Arabs still prefer this, the current, current situation of discrimination, of confiscation, of, of whatever is being done to them here in this country is still way way much better than the attitude which Arabs are getting in their own countries all over the Middle East. So they know exactly what the alternative, this is why the riots of Acre did not spread to other mixed cities as well. I think this is mainly what I wanted to say. If there are questions, I will answer yes. Sir. Uh, you didn't mention the demographic factor, and I would like you to comment on its uh, influence, for instance, on the claims uh, to legitimacy on, on the part of the um, Islamic movement, especially in the northern part of Israel, where the, it is known that the Arabs have a strong, uh, are in strong numbers, and the Jewish presence is not so strong, it's much weaker. Well, there are people 
uh, among the Jewish uh, majority who are trying to frighten the, the Jews here because of this thing, the, the demography of the Arabs in Israel. Uh, this is something like, do not uh, let facts disrupt our uh, fears. What happened during the last 20, 30 years is a deep decline of demography in the Arab sector. Women do not want to have uh, a kid every year. You see uh, the families with two kids, maybe three. I'm, I'm talking about uh, young, young families. Women are getting married at the age of 24, 25, not 14, not 15. That's why they have less kids. They want to have you know, time and pleasure. They, 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 whatever goes on in the Jewish sector, the demography, comes to the Arab sector as well. After five years, ten years maybe, but the same demography you see. Maybe a bit more because of the resources. Yet, you don't see any more the families of eight, and nine, and ten kids in the Arab sector as we saw in the 60s and 70s. The decline is very clear and uh, look, women want to, uh, to establish their career. Uh, like 10% of the women uh, between 18 and 40 in the Arab sector are not married. Like 10%. And this is data given by the state. 10% are not married. Because of various reasons. And some of the boys also don't get married. What we call the Mushkilat uh, al the those well known in other countries as well. Because of various reasons, I won't get into this. But uh, yet it has its influence on uh, the decline of the demography as well. Demography, as a slogan, uh, is a large part of it is uh, <coughs> no more than a slogan. Yes, please. The uh, document, the Arab Vision, I didn't catch when it was written. 2006. It was published then. And you the can Arab find it in the, in the website of uh, this organization. And is the Arab Higher Committee, or what is the organization? This was the umbrella of the, 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 Arab, the, the Arab Committee. It was the umbrella for the... And the fifth part of my question, when they speak of the Conspiracies have been slaughtered at the rock. Do you mean conspiracies or conspirators? Conspiracies. How do you Mezimot, Muammarat. In other words, all members of the conspiracy? No, the conspiracy itself, like the Crusade campaign, the Zionist campaign, these are the conspiracies which were and will be slaughtered on the rock of Acre. Yes, please. Uh, there was an uh, honorary consul of Poland in Jerusalem. Uh, I uh, work uh, with the Palestinian population for 40 years already, and I know them pretty well, uh, especially in Akko, where I lately was doing some work in my profession as an architect. And I think that we didn't get an answer from you. What is exactly the connection, and why in Akko and not uh, other places, and what is the connection with the terror? Uh, you, what you said it later, uh, except the uh, uh, religion uh, problem, I didn't see any other point. Uh, I will not try to explain by myself what I think about it, but this is one question. The second question is uh, that you give an excellent outlook of uh, the situation, uh, which is in a way uh, the political establishment uh, outlook of uh, Israel, uh, but uh, the, don't you think there are some nuances in this uh, uh, situation and uh, that uh, I will not try to tell what I think about it but there is a very large field to talk about and uh, you know that the Islam, you are better expressed than me to, for Islam uh, that there are ups and downs during centuries of the race and uh, going down of the Islam uh, radicalism etc. But uh, you must agree with me that uh, in 1967, for instance, uh, the people who were going to the mosque to pray on Friday, where they, they were about 10 to 5, 15 percent, no more, 
and today 10% or 15% are not going. And uh, uh, there is a big difference. Uh, maybe there are some other points. There are other answers. And the third thing, and the last one, is um, do you consider that after all these countries belong to whom? I had many lectures on this uh, question. Let me answer the last uh, remark about maybe it belongs to whoever is here. It is a rather modernistic uh, way how to solve problems, but let's see who is here, that's it. Uh, well, it, this is uh, totally against the, the narrative, because we Jews consider that every Jew in the world who has the right to return to his country, and the, the same minute he gets the citizenship. As you know, there is Chut HaShiva, or the Chok uh, which we Jews, uh, and this is a kind of discrimination, because Arabs don't have this right. Whenever a Jew, Jew coming to Israel, and he wants to get citizenship, he gets citizenship immediately. Maybe if he's a criminal, if he's not, but uh, generally, Jews are given, and this is part of the raison d'etre of this uh, state, as the state of the Jewish people, not the Jews who are living here. While Muslims say the same, the same, because a Muslim in Indonesia has the right on this country as a Muslim, just like a Muslim in uh, Nazareth. The same thing, because both are Muslims. This is why this country, as a waqf land, belongs to both. The same. So, uh, 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 this approach, which uh, I would uh, accept uh, as a modernist, as somebody who wants to solve the problems and not live with them, uh, 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 have to face the both narratives which do not uh, agree with this. Uh, with this uh. um, to the other remarks, look, I would describe the situation in Israel between Jews and Arabs as charcoals with fire, with initial fire, under a layer of sand. Okay? There is a fire, although latent fire under the sand. People are walking on the sand. The sand is warm. They know that there is fire under, under there, and they are trying very hard, not to have the flames coming out from those chunks. Here and there, like what happened in, in Akko, and you know what, I, I can tell you in, in other places, in Yafu, uh, before it happened in, in Akko, a friend of mine uh, made kind of a uh, uh, celebration in Yafu, in one of the synagogues, and uh, there were uh, dancing and uh, music and everything. All of a sudden, across the street, there was a demonstration, a demonstration of Arabs, like 50 people who came, with flags of PLO, in Yafo, demonstrated in front of them. And they were uh, arguing with each other, uh, thank God, no violence, but still, this happened in Yafo. And these little <laughs> things, do this is why I'm saying, relations between Jews and Arabs in Israel are like fire in Charcoals, which are under the <coughs> sand. And the sand is <coughs> warm. And everybody is trying not to have the flames coming out to burn the feet of everybody. Yes, please. Uh, is it getting warmer? <laughs> I, would, I would take the friend's remark about the percentage of people who were going to, to mosques. You are right. There are more people with, or more women with a hijab. You can see them very easily. I see all my students. Ten years ago, we almost didn't see in Bar-Ilan, my university, a, a student, girl, girls go out with a hijab. Today, most of the Arab students, female students, are wearing the hijab. Significant, you cannot deny it. However, you don't see those who do not go with a hijab, what they do, and how they behave. And I'll give you a very good example. There is a mixed uh, a city named Shfaraam, which means not the Jews, but those Christians and Muslims are living in this city in the north. Uh, the, all of them have, have restaurants, but during Ramadan, the Christians uh, opened the restaurants, you know, they, the, those who were operating, but behind closed doors. 
in order not to aggravate the Muslims who were fasting during the day, so the Christians were sitting in their restaurants behind closed doors in order to honor the, uh, the neighbors, the Muslim neighbors. Not to mention that the Muslim restaurants were closed. Of course, the Muslim. Today, if you go to Sfaram, during Ramadan, not only you will find the Christians sitting in the Christian uh, uh, restaurants outside, the Muslim restaurants are open during the day. And Muslims are sitting during the day, eating. During Ramadan. Muslims. Okay? You can see this very easily. Why? Democracy. Everybody does what he, what he likes. Like Rafiddin. No compulsion in religion. Okay. This is also a development. Twenty years ago you didn't see uh, women magazines in the Arab sector here in Israel. Because women magazines, you know what they are, what they preach to. Today, they have already at least two, Lilac and Lady, where they have everything. Plastic surgeries, okay? Uh, why do you have to have every, uh, a kid every year? You can use all kinds of contraceptives. You don't have to get married at all. Careers, you know, all these messages we are, which are rather against the Islamic traditional way of looking at women and what they do. You didn't see this 20 years ago, you see it now. And many other changes, mainly in the media, especially in the Fada'iyat, in the uh, satellite uh, channels, which bring all those in Hilal, all those uh, anti-Islamic uh, uh, ways of thinking and behavior into the Islamic home, into the Islamic heart. Okay, so there are, because of the, those who are going to abandon Islam inside the Islamic community, there are those who stick to Islam, like a, a dual pendulum, a, which, the one which goes to this side, one goes to this side. This is a natural a social development which we see in many other societies. Yes, please, ma'am. Um, of course, everybody talks with his own background as a frame of reference, in South Africa is mine, and unfortunately, for us, the devil is in the details. Yes. Um, um, in the beginning, you didn't, I don't know if it's working. Yeah, no. No, sure, yeah. Do you hear me? Okay. Yeah. 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 Very interesting analysis of, of the thinking on the Muslim side, especially the, the um, uh, uh, very conservative Islamic side of the Khalifat and so on. Um, but isn't there, a, in, the, in the duo, this, this fight amongst narratives, isn't it necessary also to look on the other side, although on the one hand this person was provocative by driving through the uh, Apu, um, during uh, Yom Kippur, um, the fundamentalism of the people who took offence um, also needs examination. And that brings me to the question, in your experience, what is the difference in, in between the narratives when you do introspection? In other words, do the Jews and the, and the Arabs, um, Muslims then, um, do they do introspection in different ways? The reason I ask it is both of them go back to history. The Muslims think that because of the Khalifat, no history happened after that. And the same with all Jews who want to go back before, before that. Um, before that. Whereas the Jews 
some of them think that no history happened after 2,000 years ago. So isn't that also a, another dimension in the clash of narratives and in the way in which they think about these things and do introspection and what they can do to improve the situation? Definitely. Thank you. Uh, uh, it's not only uh, uh, stuck between uh, narratives. It's uh, stuck between, I would say, even theology. And you can, you can look at the problem problem between Jews and Muslims here on the state uh, as a theological problem before it is a territorial problem. Because to whom God or Allah gave this country? Okay? So, definitely, this is, I would say, that looking into the narrative is really, you, 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 you come to the bottom line of the narrative. To whom Allah gave this country? And the answer to this question will answer other questions. Please. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, just a very, very quick question. What, um, uh, Nick Hallam, uh, National Crisis Group. Um, Nick Hallam, International Crisis Group. Um, you say that the, the sand is getting warmer. Um, what do you do about it? What's getting warmer? The sand. The sand. Well, you have to pour water on it. Means to cool it off. Um. To, to create and there are, and to develop mechanisms of both sides, sit together and start talking to each, to each other. And when you talk, usually you don't shoot. And in, in every transaction between people, when you talk with, when you sit with somebody, maybe you find, and you do find, those questions which you both suffer from. Look, I'll give you a very good example. Uh, my research, one of my researches is about the Islamic movement here in Israel. And for this uh, research, I spend much uh, time <laughs> with the leaders of, the, of both uh, Islamic movements here in Israel. The one which is represented in the Knesset, and the one who considers the other one as a traitor to Islam because they sit in the Knesset. I sit with much of them. Uh, recently, I published something about uh, education in the view of both... Uh, 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 movements, and for this uh, research, I sat much with the leaders of those uh, two movements in Israel. Although they don't like me because I'm a Zionist and I'm a Jew, and I'm, God forbid, I'm I'm religious, yet they cooperated because they they had the interest why to cooperate with me. And I must tell you, as a religious Jew, we means religious Jews and the religious Muslims can very easily cry one on the shoulder of the other about the same things. Permissiveness, how boys and girls are behaving, piercing, <laughs> media, alcoholic beverages, uh, drugs, whatever bothers a, a religious Jew, uh, which concerns education, bothers the religious Muslim. It is a Spiegelbild, okay? Mirror image, the same thing. I'm telling you, when I were listening to them, I was actually listening to our rabbis saying the same thing, but in Hebrew. This, I'm telling you, when you, when you uh, read this article, you, you might have doubts whom I'm talking about. The religious Jews or the religious Arabs? The question is yes. The, the answer is yes. Both. Okay, so we do share much uh, that we can deal with together instead of fighting together. How do we fight or how do we confront or how do we challenge the, the moral uh, uh, culture? Okay? On all, all, all the cultures which came to the public sphere, or the rating culture, or the reality TV culture, which undermines much in the Jewish religious home and the Muslim religious home. So we do share much together, even with the most radical uh, uh, religious sides of both sides. You know what? You can see the cooperation between uh, Muslims and the Haredi 
not to recover here in Jerusalem. Again, because of the same uh, threats on both cultures, which are replica of each other, uh, 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 because of this. So we do have what to uh, 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 cooperate. You know what? Look at the cooperation between Haredi Jews, Muslims, and Christians in Jerusalem to prevent the gay parade in Jerusalem. Okay? They cannot cooperate on anything else but on this. Okay? So this is viewed, the gay parade, is viewed as a threat to all of them together. So this is why they could cooperate on this question. Whether it's just right or not, I, 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 don't, I don't get into this question. But still, you can see very good cooperation in this, uh, in this question. And if you go in Jerusalem to the open house, which is the uh, house of the uh, uh, homosexual and lesbian community in Jerusalem, you can see very easily peace between Jews, Arabs, Muslims, Christians, Everybody there is living with peace. Again, when culture is being under threat, other things might be pushed to the side. And I'm not preaching for the gay and lesbian community. Can I just come back? Sorry. Uh, I mean, how, how, yeah, how is this going to address the, the structure of narratives? And the, sorry. How is, this going, going, how is that going to address the struggle of narratives and the gods that you saw in Aka? Struggle of narratives, I think, is uh, something which you cannot solve. Just like the effect that tomorrow will be Thursday. You cannot solve, although you might not like Thursdays. This is a problem which you have to live, live with like, like a migraine. Or other things. There, there are problems in life which cannot be solved. And the contradiction between those two narratives cannot be solved. It can be maintained. You can maintain it. You can smooth it. You can... Just, you know what? You live with migrant somehow. This is how you have to live with this. You cannot solve it. Malti, I may I just ask one uh, brief question? The, the title of our talk today was the... Um, recent events in Akko and its connection to the presence and growth of, of radical Islamic groups. In the Arab Israelis, the Arab citizens of Israel, Palestinian citizens of Israel, as some would like to, to call them, look to the south and they see now a Hamas state, for all practical purposes, a sovereign Hamas Islamic emirate in Gaza. They look at Iran on the march to regional supremacy with uh, surrogates in almost every country in the Middle East. They look to the north and they see Hassan Nasrallah and the Hezbollah having, in their view, very successfully um, uh, dealt with or, or uh, battled the Israelis in Lebanon. What has that effect of Islam on the march, whether it's the Salafists on the Sunni side or whether it's uh, Iran and its sort of radical Shiite um, uh, supporters on the, on the Shiite side, how has that affected the concept of, of cooperation, coexistence, and potential harmony between Arabs and Jews in Israel. How, did, how has it affected the Arabs? How do they see it here? Let me add to your question the fact that the Jihad, Islamic Jihad in Hamas, uh, came out in those days of uh, the riots in Acre with calling to the Arabs in Israel, oh, go ahead, do the same thing in Yafo, in Ramla, in Lod. They, were, uh, they tried to inflame the, the whole thing. In the media, uh, we saw it, we saw it in communiques, we saw it, we saw it very, very nicely. And, but, it didn't work. All those calling to continue or to spread the riots to other places in Israel were not to answer. Were not, uh, the Arabs in Israel are much more clever than their brothers in the Palestinian Authority. Look, um, the Muslims in Israel look at what happens in Gaza, they envy them not. They don't want what, what, what happens in Gaza. Because what happens in Gaza is a total, total chaos. Under Hamas. They, nobody wants to imitate this. Not even in Egypt. They see the reality of Gaza. That they're, they're under siege. They see the... I, I wouldn't say the hunger, but the siege is very clear. That they have to go like mice through the tunnels. Out or whatever. Nobody envies 
the people of Gaza. Nobody envies the people of Iran as well, under the regime of those Ayatollahs. 95% of the Iranians are secular. Nobody envies them. And in Lebanon as well. Uh, nobody wants to live in the situation of uh, the Shis in, in, in uh, Lebanon. And the, the Arab Israeli citizens are much wiser than uh, uh, what uh, people might think. Look, in the Arab world, many call the Arab citizens in Israel by the name Arab Zibd, means the Arabs of uh, whipped cream. And not without reason. And they, not, they do not want to give up on this whipped cream. Although it's exaggerated, but uh, still, in comparison to what goes on in the Arab world, especially in places like Gaza and Iran, they are really Arabs of whipped cream, Arabs of And they do not like this epithet, mainly because it's true. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you ever so much for joining us. What I think was a, a provocative and uh, stimulating session. On the 17th of this month, is that right, Adam? On the 17th of this month, <laughs> we're very happy to share with you that the former uh, chairman of the National Security Council, General Giora Island, uh, will be joining us to discuss the future of the two-state solution. So we hope that we will be notifying all of you. We will be delighted to see every single person in this room come back in exactly two weeks. Uh, with another uh, tasty breakfast and uh, a stimulating discussion and questions and answers. Thank you.